to analyze the concept of God in major religions adequately for all present here today, in the limited time available, we would like the following rules to be followed during the question and answer session. Questions asked should be on the topic, concept of God in major religions only. Questions not relevant to the topic, including any general questions on religion, will not be allowed. Kindly state your question briefly and to the point. Only one question at a time may be asked. For your second question, you would have to go at the back of the row again and await your second chance to ask your question. Three mics have been provided for the questions from the audience in the auditorium. Two in the front next to the stage on my right and left side and one at the back in the ladies section. Please stand in the queue at one of the mics if you wish to put a question to the speaker and speak into the mic only when the mic handing assistants hand the mic to you. We will allow one question on each of the mics in clockwise rotation. Written questions on slip papers which are available from our volunteers on the sides and in the center aisle would be given secondary preference after the questions on the mics are answered by Dr. Zakir and if time permits. Kindly state your name and profession before putting forward your question. May we have the first question from the lady side, please. Assalamualaikum. I am Sabah Bakai from Delhi and my question to Ms. Zakir uncle is, the Christian concept of the God is a trinity, the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost. But these three, one, three are one. Does this mean that they believe in only one God? The sisters asked the question that the Christians believe in Trinity, the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost and that they are one. Does it mean that they also believe in one God? Sister, if you analyze the word Trinity, it occurs nowhere in the Bible. If you search the full Bible, the word Trinity doesn't exist anywhere in the Bible. It's not there in the Bible. But the word Trinity is there in the Holy Quran. But the word Trinity is there in the Holy Quran. The Holy Quran says, in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 171, it says, Don't say Trinity. This has stopped it, it's better for you. For God is one God. It's again repeated in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 73, it says, They blaspheme those who say that Allah is one of three in a trinity. For there is no God but Allah. So the word Trinity is not mentioned in the Bible, but it is there in the Quran. And Quran says, Wala taqulu salasa. Don't say Trinity. The closest verse that you can find in the Bible, which can be taken for Trinity, is the first epistle of John. Chapter number 5, verse number 7, which says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. This verse of the Bible, first epistle of John, chapter 5, verse number 7, is the closest resemblance to Trinity in the full Bible. But if you read the Revised Standard Version, which has been revised by 32 scholars, of the highest eminence backed by 50 different Christian cooperating denominations, they have removed this verse from the Bible as an interpolation, as a concoction, as a fabrication. It was not removed by Muslims or non-Christian scholars, but it was removed by 32 Christian scholars of the highest eminence 
backed by 50 different corporate denomination as an interpolation, as a concoction, as a fabrication, because it was not there in the original manuscript. We Muslims, we should thank the galaxies of DDs, the doctors of divinity, for getting the Bible one step closer to the Quran, closer to Islam. As the Quran says, Wala taqulu salasa, don't say trinity. In fact, if you analyze, as I said in my talk, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, never spoke about trinity. That Father, Son and Holy Ghost, they were one. In fact, he said, in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse number 28, my father is greater than I. Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 29, my father is greater than all. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 28, I cast out devil with the spirit of God. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 20, with the finger of God, I cast out devil. Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just. Because I seek not my will, but the will of thy Father who has sent me. He never spoke about Trinity. In fact, when he was asked that which is the first of the commandments, he said, it's mentioned in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 12, verse number 29, Shama Israelo, Adnai Lahaino Adnai Khad, which means, Yoro Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. But if you ask the Christian church, in the catechism, they tell you that the Father is a person, the Son is a person, and the Holy Ghost is a person. But they aren't three persons, they are one person. Person, 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 but not three person, one person. What language is this? One plus one plus one is equal to three. It's not equal to one. One into three is three, not one. So when we ask them that suppose there are three triplets, identical triplets. If one of them commits murder, can you hang the other? They say no. Then you ask them why? Because each one has a different personality. If one of the triplets commit murder, you can't hang the other because each one has a different personality. And when the Christian, when they think about the Father in heaven, they think like an old man like Santa Claus sitting in the heaven on one of the planets with the earth as a footstool. When they think about the Son, that Jesus Christ peace be upon him, they think of a tall man who is fair, who has got blonde eyes, like Jeffrey Hunter, you see in the movie King of Kings. He did the acting of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, Jeffrey Hunter. They have a certain mental picture. When they talk about Holy Ghost, they think of a dove, as the Bible says, which came upon Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, when he was baptized. Or they think it like a spirit that came at the Feast of Pentecost, which is mentioned in the Bible. But when you ask the Christian that when you speak about Trinity, how many pictures do you have in your mind, the Christian will tell you one. Believe me, he's lying to you. Because one plus one plus one is three, it is not one. Hope that answers the question. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Muhammad Javed. And my question is why can't God not take a human form? The brother asked the question that why can God not take a human form? If God wants, he can take a human form. But the moment he takes a human form, he ceases to be God. Because God and man, they are two opposites. Man is mortal. God is immortal. You can't have a mortal and immortal person at the same time. Man has a beginning. God has got no beginning. You can't have a person who has a beginning and no beginning at the same time. Man has an end. God has no end. So you can't have a person having an end and no end at the same time. It doesn't make sense. So you can't have a God man. You can either have God or you can have man. You can't have a God man. So if God takes human form, he ceases to be God. He becomes human being. Because man requires to eat. God does not require to eat. 
The Quran says in Surah Anam chapter 6 verse number 14 that he feedeth everyone but doesn't require to be fed. The human beings, they require rest. They require sleep. The Quran says in Ayat al-Qursi chapter number 2 verse number 255 which was also recited by the Qari, Brother Shaf Muhammadi. Allahu la ilaha al-hayyul qayyum la ta khuzu sunatan wa la naum lau ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-ard. Allah, he is one and only. The self-existing, the eternal. No slumber can seize him, nor does he require sleep. To him belongs everything in the heaven and the earth. Therefore, God, when he takes a human form, he ceases to be God. You can't have a God-man together. And if a God becomes human being and gives up his quality and becomes man, why should you worship a human being? Because he has the same power than you and me. People will want to worship you and me also then. What is the use of worshipping a person who has the same powers like you and me? And later on if someone tells me the same human being became God, it's not possible. If human beings can become God, even you and I would become God tomorrow. Therefore, if Allah wants, He can become a human being. But He will cease to be a God. Therefore, Allah will never want to become a human being. Allah can tell a lie if He wants. But He will never tell a lie. Because to lie is ungodly. The moment he lies, he ceases to be God. Allah can do injustice if he wants. But he will not. Because to do injustice is ungodly. As the Holy Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse number 40, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is never unjust in the least degree. So if he does injustice, he ceases to be God. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he wants, he can make a mistake. But he will not make a mistake because to make mistake is ungodly. The Quran says in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse 52, that Allah does not make mistake. Allah does an err. So if he makes a mistake, he ceases to be God. Allah can forget if he wants. But he will not forget because forgetting is an ungodly act. The Quran says in Surah Taha, chapter 20, verse 52, Allah doesn't make a mistake, neither does He forget. The moment He forgets, He ceases to be God. Therefore, the Holy Quran says, Inna Allah ala kulli shayin kadir. Verily, Allah has power over all things. In several places. In Surah Baqarah chapter 2, verse number 106. In Surah Baqarah chapter number 2, verse number 109. Surah Baqarah chapter 2, verse number 284. Surah Al-Imran chapter number 3, verse 29. Surah Nahal chapter 16, verse 77. In Surah Fatir chapter 35, verse number 1, Allah says, Inna Allah ala kulli shayin kadir. For verily, Allah has power over all things. But Allah only does godly things. He doesn't do ungodly things. Because Quran says in Surah Buruj, chapter 85, verse number 16, Allah is the doer of all he intends. Whatever Allah intends, he can do. But he only intends godly things. This theory of God becoming a human form is called as anthropomorphism. Almighty, God taking a human form. And most of the major religions, sometime or the other, they have in their philosophy that God has taken a human form. Some religion once, some several times. And they have a very beautiful logic for that. They say that God Almighty, He is so pure, He is so holy, He doesn't know regarding the feelings of the human beings, regarding the shortcomings, the difficulties a human being can have. He is so holy and pure. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't know how does the human being feel when he's hurt? How does he feel when he gets into trouble? So therefore, God Almighty came in the form of a human being in this world to set the rules for the human being. On the face of it, very good logic. But I tell these people that if I manufacture a tape recorder, do I have to become a tape recorder to know what is good or what is bad for the tape recorder? No. I just write an instruction manual. When you want to play the audio cassette, put in the cassette, press the play button. When you want to stop, press the stop button. When you want to fast forward, press the FF button. Don't drop it from a height, it will get spoiled. Don't immerse it in water, it will get damaged. I write an instruction manual. I don't have to become a tape recorder to know what is good or what is bad for the tape recorder. 
Similarly, when Almighty God is our creator, he doesn't have to become a human being to know what is good or what is bad for the human being. He sends an instruction manual. And the last and final instruction manual for the human beings is the Holy Quran. The Holy Quran is the last and final instruction manual for the human beings. The do's and don'ts for the human beings. And he need not come down in this world as a human being to give us the instruction manual. What does he do? He chooses a man amongst men to deliver his message. Whom we call as messengers or prophets. Who he communicates on a higher level through the revelation. It is so clear cut to any logical person that God Almighty cannot take human form. But any fool can also understand. That is the reason the Holy Quran says in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse number 18. Sum mum buk mun um yun form la yun. The deaf, the dumb, the blind, they will not come to the true path. And the Bible gives the same message. In the Gospel of Matthew chapter number 13 verse number 13. Seeing they see not, hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. Rig Veda also gives the same message. In book number 10, chapter number 71, verse number 4, that though they see the words, they see it not. Though they hear the words, they hear not. The next question from the ladies. Eh? Assalamu alaikum. If all the major religions and scriptures speak about one God, then does it imply that all these religious scriptures, that is Bible, Vedas, etc., are the word of God? And does it further imply that whichever religion you follow, be it Islam or Hinduism or Christianity, it is one, the same? The sister has a question that I have quoted so many various scriptures and proved about the concept of Almighty God that is monotheism, does it imply that all these religious scriptures I quoted, they are the word of Almighty God? And does it imply that irrespective whether you follow Christianity, Hinduism, Islam, it's one and the same? Sister, many people have the misconception that Islam came into existence and the founder of the religion of Islam was Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, 14 years ago. In fact, Islam is there in existence since time immemorial, since man set foot on the earth. And the Holy Quran says in Surah Fatir, chapter 35, verse number 24, ummatin illa khalafiha nazir. There is not a nation or a tribe to whom we have not sent a warner. The Holy Quran says in Surah Ra, chapter number 13, verse number 7, وَلِخُلِّ قَوْمٍ had. And to every nation have we sent a guide. By name, only 25 are mentioned in the Holy Quran. But our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, there were more than 124,000 messengers sent on the face of the earth. By name, we know only 25 mentioned the Holy Quran. Adam, Moses, Jesus, Solomon, Muhammad, peace be upon them all. But there were more than 124,000 messengers sent on the face of the earth. Similarly, by name, we know only four revelations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God. The Torah, the Zabur, the Injil, and the Furqan. Torah is the Wahi, the revelation which was given to Moses, peace be upon him. Zabur is the Wahi, the revelation which was given to David, peace be upon him. Injil is the Wahi, the revelation which was given to Jesus, peace be upon him. And Furqan, that's the Holy Quran, is the last and final revelation which was given to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But if you analyze that all the other scriptures, whether are they the word of God or not? Bible, can I say it's the word of God or not? We believe in the Injil, the Wahi which was given to Isa alayhi salam. This Bible that the Christians have today is not the Wahi which we believe in. This Bible does contain the word of God. It also contains the word of prophet and also words of historian as well as pornography. It's totally not the word of God. No wonder the Christian scholars, they're keeping on revising the Bible. We believe in the original Wahi given to Isa alayhi salam, but the present Bible is not 
the correct wahi it may contain part of the wahi how to check up which part is true you have to check it with the furqan and the furqan is the holy quran similarly if you analyze all the messengers that were sent before prophet muhammad peace be upon him all the revelation that came before holy quran all of these revelations and these messengers were only sent for their people and the message was supposed to be followed only for a particular limited time period as the holy quran says in surah al-imran chapter 3 verse 49 that isa alayhi salam he was sent only for the bani israel the message is repeated in surah saf chapter 61 verse number 6 that isa alayhi salam the son of mary was sent only for the bani israel the children of israel the same message is given in the bible in the gospel of matthew chapter number 10 verse number 5 to 6 that jesus christ peace be upon him tells his disciples that go ye not into the way of the gentiles who are the gentiles the non jews the hindus the muslims go ye not into the way of the gentiles but rather go to lost sheep of the house of israel that means he was only sent for the house of israel jesus christ peace be upon him said it's mentioned in the gospel of matthew chapter number 15 verse number 24 that I have not been sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So all the messengers and all the revelation by name only four revelations are given in the Holy Quran. But there were several revelations of Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala like Sufa Ibrahim and various other revelation. But all the revelation that came before the Holy Quran and all the messengers that came before Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him they were only sent for their people and for a particular time period. But our beloved Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, the Holy Quran says in Surah Al Anbiya, chapter twenty-one, verse number one hundred and seven, it says, "Wama arsalna ka illa rahmat al alamin." That we have sent thee not, but as a mercy to the whole of humankind, as a mercy to all the worlds, as a mercy to all the creatures. The Holy Quran says in Surah Sabah, chapter thirty-four, verse number twenty-eight, that "Wama arsalna ka illa kafat al nas bashiro wa naziro." that we have sent thee not but as a universal messenger giving glad tidings and warning them against sin but most of the human kind yet do not know similarly all the religious scriptures that were sent by allah subhanahu wa taala that came before the quran were only meant for that people and for a particular time period but the holy quran it says in surah ibrahim chapter 14 verse 52 as well as surah baqara chapter 2 verse 185 and surah az-zumur chapter 39 verse number 41 that it was sent for the whole of humanity regarding a question that are these scriptures the vedas the bible the zad avesta the satir the upanishad are they the word of almighty god what i can say that we believe in injil as the word of god but the present bible is not the word of god regarding veda upanishad gita zad avesta dasati i can say maybe they were the word of god maybe i cannot say for sure since the quran does not say that veda is the word of god i cannot say for sure i can only say maybe they were word of god but even if they were the word of god all the scriptures besides the holy quran have been changed by human being they have been corrupted as a famous critic of islam william muir he said two centuries before that the only religious scriptures which has maintained its purity is the holy quran for 12 centuries william muir who is a very strong critic of islam he had to agree that this quran has maintained its original purity for 12 centuries he said this 200 years before so regarding the messengers with the ram with the lakshman all these were they messengers of god or not jesus christ peace be upon him he was because the quran says but the name of ram and buddha and zoroaster is not mentioned in the quran so what i can say maybe they were i don't know but even if they were they were only meant for that time and they were only supposed to be followed by that particular people the scriptures that came before the quran they were only meant for a particular group of people and they were only meant to be followed till that time so even if they were words of god even if the previous messengers were messengers of god 
you only have to follow the last and final messenger that is prophet muhammad peace be upon him even if the other scriptures were the word of god today you have to follow the last and final message of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is the holy quran and nothing else regarding can you be a christian hindu muslim it's the same no sister it's not the same why because if you analyze the holy quran says in Surah Al Imran, chapter 3, verse number 52, that Jesus, peace be upon him, he was a Muslim. Same thing as the Bible says in the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse number 30. I seek not my will, but the will of my Father. If you translate into Arabic, not my will, God's will, it is nothing but Islam. He was a Muslim. Abraham, peace be upon him, the Holy Quran says in Surah Al Imran, chapter 3, verse 67, he was not a Jew or a Christian, he was a Muslim. So today if you have to choose any religion, the Holy Quran says in Surah Al Imran chapter 3 verse number 19, in Naddina in the Allah Islam, the only religion acceptable in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Islam. Though the other religions speak about monotheism, only monotheism is not sufficient. You have to believe in Tawheed. You have to do the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why the Holy Quran repeats the message in Surah Al Imran chapter 3 verse number 85 that if anyone desires any other religion besides Islam submitting the will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it will not be accepted of him and in the year after he'll be among the losers hope that answers the question Assalamu alaikum I'm Azam Khan and a mechanical engineer by profession first I congrats you for the beautiful speech you had delivered now my question is water is called by different names in different languages like in English as water in Hindi as Pani in Tamil as Tani similarly if God is either called Ram or Jesus is it not one and the same so that was the question that water in different languages can be called as water in English, Pani in Hindi, Tani in Tamil. Similarly, God is one. Can we not call him by Ram or Jesus, etc.? Peace be upon him. As I mentioned in my talk, the Holy Quran says in Surah Isra, chapter 17, verse number 110, Qulidullah Abidur Rahman, Tadu, Fala al Asma al Husna. Say, call upon him by Allah or by Rahman. By whichever name you call upon him, to him belongs the most beautiful name. You can call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by any name, but it should be a beautiful name and it should not conjure up a mental picture. It should contain the qualities of Almighty God. And the same message is repeated in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 8. In Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 180. As well as in Surah Al-Hashar, chapter 59, verse number 24, which says, to Allah belongs the most beautiful names. You can call him by any name, but it should not conjure up a mental picture. Regarding a question that water is called by different names in different languages, and I know about it. In English, it's called as water. In Hindi, as Pani. In Tamil, as Tani. In Arabic, it's called as Ma. In Surah Alambia, chapter 21, verse number 30. In Sanskrit, it's called as Apa. In Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 7, verse number 4. In Shuddha Hindi, it's called as Jal. In Gujarati, as Jal or Pani. In Marathi, as Pani. It's called as in Kannad. It's called as Nir. In Telugu, Nir. And Malayalam as Vellam. Various languages. You can call. I gave you only 10 examples. Quran gives 99 attributes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But... There is no objection if you call water in any language as long as it is water in any language. But it should be water. It should not be something else. For example, if suppose someone comes and tells me that I have been advised by my friend that every day in the morning I should have one glass of pani. I know pani means water, so I understand what he's saying. But then he continues, but when I have that one glass of pani, I feel like vomiting. I ask him, why do you feel like vomiting? So he tells me, because the water stinks. It is yellowish in color. Later I realize 
that what he's talking is not pani it is urine <laughs> so somebody told him that you have one glass of urine but the name he gave was pani so you can call water by pani tani mani apa pani no problem but it should be water you can call water by any name but anything else beside water neither can you call it water neither can you call it pani neither can you call it tani neither can you call it as my what as water you can call but something else as water you can't call people may think that what an illogical example even an ignorant person can make out the difference between urine and water only a fool will not know the difference between urine and water and i agree with them that even an ignorant person knows the difference between urine and water similarly those people who know the concept of almighty god the correct concept they say that these people who worship false god they are not only ignorant they are foolish can't they differentiate between a true god and a false god you give it any name but if it's a true god you can give it the name of god if it's not a true god you're giving false god the name of god and they foolish they are foolish for example if you want to buy some gold there the person who comes and wants to sell his gold jewelry to you and he says this is 24 karat sona you know that sona in hindi means gold in arabic it is zahaba you know it very well but even after knowing that sona in hindi is for gold yet you will not just buy it like that you will verify whether the sona what is calling 24 karat sona is it actually 24 karat gold or not you not just buy it off what will you do you will go to a goldsmith and verify whether it is actually 24 karat sona or not and after verifying with the touchstone you know i give the example of touchstone in my talk he tells you it is fake though the jewelry was glittering but all that glitter is not gold you will verify before buying the sona whether it's actually sona or not why because you have to pay money for it you know you don't want to lose because you know if you lose a thousand rupees or ten thousand rupees it's precious so why don't you do the same when anyone says this is god you check it up with the touchstone which is the touchstone surah class chapter number 112 verse number 1 to 4 which says qul huwa allahu ahad say he is allah one and only allah hu samad allah the absolute and eternal lam yalid wa lam yulad he begets not nor is begotten wa lam yakul lahu kuffan ahad there is nothing like him so anyone says this is god you first check it up with the touchstone whether actually is god or not if he fits in that definition we have got no objection accepting that person who they are calling as almighty god for example suppose some lunatic he says that muhammad peace be upon him he is almighty god a lunatic if he says that we know we muslims we love our beloved prophet muhammad peace be upon him we love him we will do anything for him we obey him even the non muslims michael h hart when he wrote a book on 100 most influential people in the world number one he gave to the last and final messenger prophet muhammad peace be upon him yet yet in spite of that we will use the touchstone surah class though we respect him maximum amongst all the human beings yet we will check with the touchstone surah class qul huwa allahu ahad say is allah one and only is muhammad one and only may peace be upon him allah has sent several messengers he is not the only messenger we agree is the last and final but quran says you have to believe in all the messengers do not differentiate in the belief of the messengers second is allah hu samad allah the absolute and eternal we know that our beloved prophet muhammad peace be upon him he was a great human being but he was not absolute and eternal he toiled he worked hard his biography tells us that he was even stoned many times he prayed to almighty god he was not absolute and eternal third test is lam bil walam yulad he begets not nor is begotten we know that he was born in mecca he had a father and mother by the name of abdullah and amina he had parents he had children also fatima may allah be pleased with her ibrahim may allah be pleased with him he had he was begotten and he also beget so he is not allah subhanahu wa taala for sure though we muslim we love our prophet 
we respect our prophet no muslim in his true senses will ever say that prophet muhammad is almighty god never you know why because allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has seen to it that the islamic creed the shahada says la ilaha illallah muhammad rasulullah there is no god but allah and prophet muhammad is the messenger of allah we say this five times a day minimum in the adhan in the aqama before salah we always say there is no god but allah and prophet muhammad peace be upon him is the messenger of allah he is the servant of allah to see to it that no one however much he may love he may not equate him to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so whoever you are saying is almighty god you use the touchstone whether it be jesus whether it be ram whether it be krishna whether it be buddha whether it be mahavir use the touchstone i have given you the touchstone on the day of judgment i can give shahada to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the thousands of people that were present here i showed them how to use the touchstone now the god that you worship <laughs> the god that you worship you apply this formula of touchstone to that god if it passes the touchstone even i agree he is almighty god if it doesn't pass then you cannot call him god at all hope that answers the question my name is md marathe i am a te technologist before i start i would just like to explain that i would like to take the audience from the sentimental plane to a more scientific and rational plane i hope i have a permission to that today's school books present the following information in the course of evolution the animal man or homo erectus evolved 2 million years ago with a brain size of 1000 cc against a size of 400 cc of the apes evolution continued with the brain growing to 1400 cc 200000 years ago and this animal was known as homo sapien the present form of man was evolved about 35000 years ago and is known as homo sapien sapien anthropologists have estimated that man developed a speech center in his brain 50000 years ago now the question is in this record of development when did god originate and for what purpose number 2 the progress of science has made it possible uh, to only one question sir you any no, no, question this is in relation to that if you cut it short no no it's, it's, where is it? the answer will not be long okay. give me the time for the question please question. yeah yeah okay when the progress God of science has made it possible to clone all animals including man to produce any number of animals having all desired characteristics if god ever existed how much of the power attributed to god is now left with him sorry and the last if god is ever existed how much of the power attributed to god is now left with him third one god is described as a sea of kindness finish and mercy yet all leaders of all religions when faced with the prospect of death rush to a hospital like the one next door and never to the place of worship where they preach all day life that man lives and dies by the wish of god is there an explanation for this phenomenon so brother has asked basically three questions first he gave according to him the theory of evolution of man and said where does god fit in secondly after as god has created all this thing how much of his power has been reduced thirdly that when you get sick you run to the hospital not to the temple or church or masjid three part of the question he said the answer will be short the question was long so imagine to give a detailed answer will take time brother i like to tell you that what you quoted about the homo sapiens etc you are talking about the theory of evolution brother theory of evolution i am a medical doctor i have not come across a single book in my life which says fact of evolution it is theory of evolution and even i know about the theory of evolution and about the darwin's theory complete answer refer to my video cassette quran and modern science conflict or conciliation what darwin said was only a theory he wrote a letter to his friend thomas thompson in 1881 that i believe in this theory of natural selection because i don't have any proof only because it helps me in natural selection it helps me in embryology in classification in rudimentary organs there's no book saying the fact of evolution all the books say theory of evolution that's why if we have to say to a friend 
that if you are present at Darwin's time, Darwin's theory would have been proved right. Trying to insinuate you to look like an ape. They were missing links. Darwin himself said the missing links. You spoke about the hormone, you only spoke about one wave. I'll tell you about all the four waves. The first wave was Lucy. Lucy. Lucy was first wave which came three and a half million years. You talk about two million years, I'm telling you what scientists have said three million years ago. Lucy. It died out by the ice age. The second came the Homo erectus. Homo erectus. About 500,000 years. After that came the Neanderthal man. The third wave. About 40,000 years ago. And the last was the Cro-Magnon. But brother, there is no link between all these stages. It's only a hypothesis. According to P.P. Grasse, according to P.P. Grasse, who held the chair of evolutionary studies in Paris, in Shoujan University, in 1971, he said, it is letting our imagination run too wild, just based on vestiges to say who our ancestors were. I do know there are some people who speak about Darwin's theory. I am a medical doctor, I know about that. But do you know, there are hundreds of scientists who speak against it. The few scientists, few scientists speak in favor, but there are more who speak against it. For the complete answer, refer to my video called the Quran Modern Science. There are few scientists because there is no fact of evolution, they say let's support a theory. Quran doesn't support any theory or hypothesis. Quran speaks about fact. So regarding your two million years, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no beginning. When man came, no one knows the exact date. No one knows. Assumption, assumption. Assumption is there. But Quran says the first man was Adam alayhi salam. First man. And with it came Eve. May Allah be pleased with her. Man hasn't reached that stage. There is not a single statement in the Holy Quran which science has proved wrong yet. Hypothesis go against the Quran. Theories go against the Quran. There is not a single scientific fact which is mentioned in the Holy Quran which goes against established science. It may go against theory. So brother, your thing is only supported by few people, not by the majority. Regarding second part of the question, that if Allah has created all these things, how less His power has become? You can't understand it completely. As the Quran says in Surah Anam chapter 6 verse 103, is beyond comprehension. I can give you a simile, not exactly same, an ocean. If you take a drop out of the ocean, how much does the level of the ocean go down? How much? How much? Yeah. Yet, yet, in spite of this, the difference between Allah becoming less when He creates things and the difference between the level of the ocean becoming less is infinite. The level of the ocean may become 0 0 0 0 0 0 somewhere, 0 0.000 somewhere it will end. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not even and not even a bit becomes this. He is all powerful. That's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If such a God who becomes less, we don't worship such God who becomes less, he keeps on creating, he will sometimes lose his power. So this God is eternal, absolute. As I said in my talk, he is absolute and eternal. Everything depends on him. He doesn't depend on anything. Where did Allah come? Allah was before the universe created. Where does he fit in? Where did he get created? He is uncreated. You ask me the question, where did he come into existence? He is uncreated. It's like you asking me that when I tell that my friend, he told me that my brother Tom, he gave birth to a child. Is the child girl or a boy? I being a doctor know very well a man cannot give birth to a child. So where does the question come whether it's girl or a boy? So you are asking me, when did Allah come fit in the picture? Allah is uncreated. Because He is uncreated, the question doesn't arise, when did He come? He is there. Question doesn't arise. Regarding a third part of the question, that when people get sick, they run to the hospital. They don't run to the temple. They don't run to the mosque. Not to the church. The brother may not be knowing all the people. I am a doctor, I know. That when the doctors give up, the thing we doctors say, We doctors say, who is Shafi? It is he who cures. 
that doesn't mean the person gets sick only go to the temple because the quran says in surah nahl chapter 16 verse 43 as well as in surah furqan chapter 25 verse 59 if you are in doubt go to a person who knows who is an expert if you get sick besides praying to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala go to a person who is an expert in medicine go to a doctor quran says that but even after going to the doctor have faith in allah because he is the person who cures you he can cure you with a doctor or without a doctor so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says we don't believe in blind belief no muslim scholar will ever say if you are sick don't go to a doctor go to a doctor but finally the person who cures is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's why all the doctors when all their brain all their science all the medicine fails they say it is only allah who can save you assalamu alaikum brother i am dr kamar ara and my question is christians explain the concept of trinity as well as that god can take human form by giving the example that water can be present in three states as solid like ice liquid as water and gas as vapor yet it is one and the same water similarly a person can also be a father a brother a businessman at the same time but yet he is the one and the same person so why not the father the son and the holy spirit This is the question regarding Trinity. The Christians have the concept of Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. The previous question was, I proved it, that from the Bible, Jesus, peace be upon him, never believed in Trinity. Now she gave an example. She is giving a human logic, asking a question, that if water can be present in three states, as solid, liquid and gas, as ice, water and vapor, when water can be in three states, why can't God be? Similarly, the Christian missionary posed the question, even God Almighty can be present in three forms, Father, Son and Holy Ghost. Now if you analyze, I do agree matter can be in three states, solid, liquid and gas. But you should realize that if water is present in three states, solid, liquid, gas, as ice, water and vapor, in all the three states, the constituent, the component of water is the same, H2O. Even if it's ice, the constituent and component is H2O. Even when it is water, it is H2O. Even when it is vapor, it is H2O. Even when it's ice, even when it is gas or liquid, it is H2O. That's very important. Now let's analyze the example they gave of Trinity. Father, Son and Holy Ghost. In three forms, if you say, for sake of argument, I agree. But are the constituent of all these three things, Father, Son, that is Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, and Holy Ghost the same? We know very well that human beings have got flesh and bone. A spirit and God Almighty has got no flesh and bone. Human beings require to eat. God Almighty does not require to eat. And the same message Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, gave. It's mentioned in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 24, verse number 39 to 43, that, Behold my hands and feet. It's I myself, handle me and see that a spirit has got no flesh and bone as you see me have. And he gave his hands and feet. And they were overjoyed. To prove what? That he was not a spirit. He was not God Almighty. And the verse continues. Do you have meat to eat? And the next verse says that he ate broiled fish and honeycomb. To prove what? That he was God. To prove that he was not God. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, A spirit has no flesh and bone as I have. Proving that he was not a spirit, he was not Almighty God. Regarding the second example, just to give the example, that a person can be a father, a brother, and a businessman at the same time. So why can't God be father, son, and Holy Ghost? It's a very good example. And I do agree that one person can be a father, can be a brother, and can be a businessman at the same time. Many people out here also may be father, brother and businessman at the same time. But if suppose the sister of that man tells a secret to the brother, but natural, even the father and businessman will know that secret. 
because if I am the same person, if a sister tells the secret to the brother, who is a father and a businessman at the same time, when the secret is told to the brother, even the father part of that man and businessman part of that man will know that secret. But when you read in the Bible, in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 13, verse number 32, it says, Of that day, of that hour, knoweth no man, no, not even the angels in the heaven, nor the Son of Man, but the Father. The knowledge of the hour of that day, no one knows Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, except the Father, not even the angels, not even himself. If Father, that is God Almighty, and Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, one and the same, then if knowledge of hour is known to God Almighty, even Jesus should know about it, peace be upon him. This proves that they were not one. <laughs> further, further, if the brother dies, even the man and the businessman will die. If the brother dies, even man and businessman will die. But when Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, according to the Bible, according to the Christian, he died on the cross. Do you mean to say, even God Almighty and the Holy Ghost died? Assalamu alaikum. I am Riyaz Vadkaunkar and a businessman. So my question is, Allah is the most appropriate name for God. Uh, so besides Quran, is it mentioned in any other religious scriptures? The brother posed the question that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as I explained in my talk, is an appropriate name for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God. Is this name Allah mentioned anywhere else in the other religious scriptures? If you analyze most of the religious scriptures which have the concept of Almighty God, somewhere or the other, most probably, one of the attributes of God Almighty is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, if you read the Bible, in the Hebrew language, they call God Almighty as Elohim. Him is a sign of respect in the Semitic languages. So actually it is Elo, Elo for God. And if you read the Bible, Old Testament also, it says for God, Elo or Ella. And in the English Bible, revised by Reverend Scofield, he gives the spelling of Ella as alternatively either as E-L or E-L-A-H or A-L-A-H. They pronounce as Ella. El, Ella or Ella. A-L-A-H. We Muslims, when we write in English Allah, we write A-L-L-A-H. But Reverend Scofield wrote A-L-A-H. They pronounce Ella, we pronounce Allah. When I was in school, I was taught Tio tu, dio du, geo, geo is what? Not go, it is go. I was taught beauty but, beauty cut, nut nut, beauty, not but, but. I said, what sort of a language is this? They said, no, you have to say beauty but, not but. And if I have to pass the examination, even I say beauty but. Geo is not go, it is go. I have to, because it's their language. Similarly, we know how to pronounce correctly Allah. They say Allah, we say no problem. The right pronunciation is Allah. Later on, when Reverend Scofield realized what he had done, that he is coming closer to the Quran, maybe people took objection. In the revived edition, that thing is taken out. A-L-A-H is taken out. So now when you get the Scofield English Bible, only E-L and E-L-A-H is there. A-L-A-H is not there. But in spite of that, yet, Alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in every Bible, yet, the name of Allah is there. Because, according to the Bible, when Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, allegedly he was crucified, it's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 27, verse number 46, as well as in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 15, verse number 34, when he was put on the cross, he cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. So as to say, O oh God, O oh God, why hast thou forsaken me? If you analyze and ask them that what is Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? It's a Hebrew quotation. But it has been maintained. Even in the English Bible, it has been maintained. And then they translate. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. O oh God, O oh God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some people say the name of God is Jehovah. So I ask them, does Allah, Allah, Lama Sabakhtani sound like Joha, Joha, why has thou forsaken me? They say no. Does it sound like Jesus, Jesus, peace be upon him, why has thou forsaken me? They say no. Hebrew and Arabic language are sister languages. 
if you translate l i l i lama sabaktani into arabic it is allah allah lama taraktani does it sound similar yes why sister language and the best part of it is that the bible has been translated into more than 2000 different languages and in every languages this quotation is verbatim the same Allah, Allah, Lama Sabaktani. Whether it's a Tamil Bible, Chinese Bible, Hebrew Bible, any Bible, this Hebrew quotation has been maintained and the word Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there in each and every translation of the Bible. This word Allah, like Guru Nanak, one of the attributes he gave to God is Rahim. Also, he gave Allah. If you read the Hindu scriptures, Upanishads, one of the Upanishads is called as the Allah Upanishad and God Almighty has called by Allah several times even in Rig Ved, even if you read the Rig Ved, the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala one of the attributes is given in book number 2 hymn number 1 verse number 11 the name one of the attributes of God Almighty is Allah they write it as I-L-A but when you pronounce it we have to tell them pronounce it as Allah hope that answers the question Assalamu alaikum. My name is Haji Muhammad. Brother Zakir, Brother Zakir, you mentioned in your talk that Jesus never claimed divinity. But it is mentioned in the Bible that Jesus said, I and my father are one. Does this not imply that he claimed divinity? Brother, there was a question that I said in my talk that nowhere does the Bible say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, claimed divinity. And he gave a quotation of the Bible that Jesus said, I and my father are one. What the brother is quoting is a verse from the Bible in the Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 30, which does say, I and my father are one. But when you ask the Christian missionaries that what is the context? I have not yet met a Christian missionary who can tell you the context without opening the Bible. He knows I and my father are one, but he doesn't know the context. For example, if I quote to someone that the Quran says, do not pray, most of the Muslims will be shocked. What is I am talking? And if you open it, it does say do not pray, but it's half the verse. Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 43 says, do not pray with your mind before. Do not pray when you are intoxicated. So if I only quote do not pray, it will mean Quran says don't pray. Half the quotation. So for context, I and my father are one, you have to go Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 23, and I'm quoting from my memory, that Jesus walked into the temple in Solomon's porch, verse number 24. Says, and the Jews came around him and asked him, How long does thou make us doubt? If thou art the Christ, tell us plainly. Verse number 25 says, I told you, but you believe me not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. Verse number 26 says, that you believe not because you are not my sheep as I said unto you the Jews they were asking Jesus Christ peace be upon him that why don't you speak plainly so he tells them that yes I am the Messiah I have told you clearly but because you are not my sheep you don't believe in me verse number 27 continues Jesus Christ peace be upon him continues saying that my sheep they hear my voice and I know them and they follow me verse 28 that I give them eternal life no man can pluck them out of my hand and they shall not perish verse number 29 says my father who give it to me he is greater than all no man can pluck them out of my father's hand then verse number 30 says I and my father are one any person who has little bit sense can make out I and my father are one doesn't mean one as one person it means one in purpose. Verse number 28 says, No man can pluck them out of my hand. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is saying, No man can pluck them out of my hand. Verse 29 is saying, No man can pluck them out of my father's hand. Verse number 30 says, I and my father are one. In purpose. Both Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, and Almighty God, they are one in purpose. If I say that my father is a doctor, and he is a doctor, Alhamdulillah, even I am a doctor. If I say, I and my father are one, what does it mean? It means one in purpose. 
as medical profession my father is a doctor even i am a doctor it doesn't mean that i and my father are one it means my father is a medical doctor even i am a medical doctor but christian say no no it means one actual unity so we say okay you say actual unity let's read further if you go ahead in the gospel of john chapter number 17 verse number 21 it says that jesus christ peace be upon him said that he all of them are one my father in me and i in thee we all are one does it mean that god almighty is in jesus christ and jesus christ is in all his 12 disciples so there will be 14 gods jesus christ god almighty and 12 disciples the same one is used there and here if you go to the source the same word is used if you go to the greek same word is used so does it mean you will have 14 gods and among those disciples judas was a traitor even he is god thomas doubted jesus christ peace be upon him is he god peter jesus christ says he is satanic is he also god no all of them god almighty jesus christ and the apostle are one in purpose they are same again if you go two verses ahead gospel of john chapter 17 verse 23 says that i am in thee and you are in me he tells the disciple does it make all of them god no it means one in purpose but then christian will so okay, i have quoted the first part why don't you quote after that after verse number 30 gospel of john chapter 10 let's go ahead gospel of john chapter number 10 verse number 31 says and jews picked up stones again to stone at jesus peace be upon him verse number 32 says and jesus peace be upon him asked them for which of the good works of my father do you stone me verse 33 says that we don't stone you for any good work but because you blaspheme being a man call yourself god that's why we stone you what about him i am reading from my memory any person wants to check up can check up it's there in the bible gospel of john chapter 10 verse 23 onwards i'm quoting so jesus christ peace be upon him gives the answer the jews say that see he is trying to blaspheme calling himself god good riddance they want to kill him good riddance the so christians oh the jews called him god almighty see they understood him correctly for redemption one wants for redemption they are calling him god the other group of people for good riddance but the answer is given in the next verse verse number 34 of john chapter 10 gospel of john chapter 10 says that is it not mentioned in your scriptures that ye are gods and if the person to whom the word of god came if he says god the scripture is not broken if you check up in the bible in the psalm chapter number 82 verse number 6 does say that ye are gods so jesus christ gave the answer that the person to whom the word of god came if you call him god it is not blaspheme it is meaning that they are one in purpose hope that answers the question assalamu alaikum this is uh, yasin i am a software engineer by profession my question is the hindu pandits and scholars agree that the vedas and other hindu religious scriptures prohibit idol worship but initially because the mind may not be matured therefore an idol is required for concentration while worshiping after the mind reaches higher consciousness the idol is not required for concentration what do you have to say about this the brother has a question that the hindu pandits and scholars they agree that the vedas is against idol worship against making image of almighty god but they give the logic that initially because the mind is not matured you require idol to concentrate later on when you reach higher consciousness idol is not required if this is the logic i would like to say that we muslims have already reached the higher consciousness you don't require you don't require any idols to concentrate on almighty god we have already reached the higher consciousness if this is the logic but now let's analyze once i was having a discussion with a swami from the iskon hari ram hari krishna you know it's in bombay hari ram hari krishna he came to irf and we were having a discussion on idol worship so he gave me the example that brother zakir see when your son asks you why does it thunder so you tell him that ai ma chakki pisti hai ai ma chakki pisti hai that is the grandmother in heaven she is grinding flower why because the child is innocent can understand therefore we give this similarly human beings because they are immature initially idol is allowed later on when they get mature idol is not allowed so i tell them and i told this swami from his con hari ram hari krishna 
that I will never tell my child when he asks me why does it thunder that I am a chaki pisti. Grandmother is grinding flour. You know why? Because to tell a lie is haram. It is wrong to tell a lie in Islam. You cannot tell, even if it is a white lie you can't say. In extreme cases, certain cases, someone puts a gun and you lie, that's the different thing. Otherwise, normal circumstances, why should a person lie? Because if I tell my son that I am a chakki pisti hai, grandmother is grinding flour in heaven, when he goes to school and when the teacher teaches him that the thundering after lightning is due to expansion of rapidly heated air, he will think the teacher is lying. And afterwards, when he comes to know the fact, he will say, my father was a liar. I am a chakki ne pisti hai. So this is the problem, that why should you say such wrong things? And this philosophy, they're common amongst all the human beings. Common, most of them, if not all. And you know, we have like those people who stay in a building, like when they play with the children, you know, they throw the toy out. Kawa leke gaya, Kuro has taken it, you know? You do the action of throwing the toy out of the building, Kawa leke gaya. Then you find even your child is throwing out toys. <laughs> and then when you ask these parents, why are your children throwing out toys? Everyone does, all the children do, all the children do. The mother will tell, all the children throw out toys. So if my child throws, what is great? All the children don't throw. It is because most of the parents do this trick. So even he wants to do that trick, even he throws it out. My son, Alhamdulillah, we are staying in nine story. Nine story in Masgon. My son has never thrown out any toys. You know why? I have never played the trick with him. So you teach wrong things and your child remains following wrong things. Best is to give the answer. Simplify. Simplify and give the answer. To the best of the understanding, I know the child, many things don't understand. Give the answer in a simple way. But if you don't know the answer, you should have the guts to tell the truth, I don't know. But most of the children, especially nowadays, they won't take the simple answer. If I tell my son I don't know, he will tell me, Abba, why don't you know? <laughs> So what happens, then we have to do our homework. We have to go and find the answer. It educates us as well as our children. But never tell a lie. You can never let your child grow up on falsehood. There are other pundits, when I have discussions, they give me the example. Let's see Brother Zakir. We do know that Vedas are against idol worship and it's wrong to do idol worship. But initially in standard one, because the mind is not matured, idol worship is fine. But when they graduate, then idol worship is not required. So I tell them that if a person goes to school in standard one, the fundamentals, the basics of any subject should be strong. If the basics and fundamentals are strong, in future even the structure will be strong. If the basics are not strong, the structure will not be strong. So if a teacher teaches in standard one, in mathematics, 2 plus 2 is equal to 4. Even after he goes to standard 3, 4, 5, when he passes school, when he becomes a graduate, even if he does PhD in mathematics, yet 2 plus 2 will always remain 4. He may learn trigonometry, algebra, logarithms, but the basics of arithmetic addition, 2 plus 2, will remain the same. If the teacher teaches wrong things, 2 plus 2 is 5, or 2 plus 2 is equal to 6, in standard 1, what will happen to the student when he graduates? Therefore, the basics should always be strong. The fundamentals should always be strong. And these scholars, they know very well, the fundamentals of the Vedas are regarding concept of God, that God has got no image. You cannot make any idol of God. That's the fundamental. I ask these people that if you know that the followers of a religion are doing wrong things, it's your duty to correct them. If your son says 2 plus 2 is equal to 5, will you keep quiet? In standard 1, you say, no, no, let him graduate, then I tell him that 2 plus 2 is equal to 4. Will you say that? You'll correct him initially. You won't wait till he graduates. As much as you can explain, you explain. So if they know the Vedas are against idol worship, it's their job to tell the people that this is the fundamental of faith, even in the initial stages, you can worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without an idol. Hope that answers the question. Now we would allow one question on the slip and one on the mic in continuing in the clockwise rotation so that we give an opportunity for the people who have taken the trouble to write the question on the slip. One question on the slip, then on the mic, again on the slip, then on the mic, again on the slip and on the mic. Uh, 
the question is when all believe in one god why people fight in the name of god and in the name of religion the person has a question that if all the people all the human beings or most of them believe in one god believe in one type of religion why do they fight why is there so much of infighting riots etc no no religion which i know of tell that people should fight with each other unnecessarily no religion says that neither the quran neither the veda neither the bible unnecessarily should not and the holy quran says in surah maida chapter number 5 verse number 32 if anyone kills any human being unless it be for murder or creating mischief in the land it is as though you have killed the whole of humanity quran does not say if you kill a muslim you have killed the whole of humanity if you kill any human being unless it be for murder or creating mischief in the land it is as though you have killed the whole of humanity so no religion teaches that people should fight with each other unnecessarily suppose people are trying to oppress you then most of the religion says that you should put that oppressor back in its place quran says that surah anfal surah tauba that if the people try to drive you out of your house out of your faith out of your land then you can fight them for self defense even the gita the whole bhagavad gita it is known as the nectar of the vedas lord krishna he is giving advice to arjun that see you fight for the truth even if the opposite people are relatives don't stop if they are in the wrong you fight the quran says in surah isra chapter 17 verse 81 wa qul jaal haqq wa zaq al batil inna al batil qana zahuka wa nazul min al quran ma huwa shifa wa rahmat al mu'minin wa la is zalim illa khasara that when truth is heard against falsehood falsehood perishes for falsehood is by its nature bound to perish the quran is a healing and mercy for those who believe it was revealed in stages but for those who are unbelievers it's nothing but loss after loss so basically no religion tells you to fight unless in self defense even the police kills the robber in self defense kills the criminal but normally under normal circumstances people should not fight but yet i do know that people fight why is the big question you know what the reason the reason is people fight for power for material things the politician he wants vote so what does he do he instigates a riot a riot and then you get marginalized and then hindus vote hindu muslim vote muslim politicians if a builder wants a land you can't acquire the land because there are thousand huts there what does he do he instigates a riot on the base of religion the huts are burned down and then he builds a big building on that land for money so these people for power for money for material requirements these people they instigate the riots otherwise the common hindu the common muslim alhamdulillah we love each other we love our non muslim brother <laughs> bombay if you know bombay even during partition there was not such a right as we had a couple of years ago were engineered by whom politicians politicians engineered it all because for power for material desire otherwise no religion says that you should fight with one another we do know we have similarities we agree with that we have differences also but a politician on front of everyone you say ram bhi khuda allah bhi khuda front of it and behind he goes an engineers rights see we don't believe in pseudo secularism if suppose two people are there one person is saying 2 plus 2 is equal to 4 the other person is saying 2 plus 2 is equal to 5 that does not mean oh it's such a good man 2 plus 2 is also equal to 4 2 plus 2 is also equal to 5 i am a very deshbhakt secular person what secular hypocrisy I should have the guts to say, see what you are saying. Two plus two is equal to four, is right? What you are saying, two plus two is five, is wrong. But I will not fight with you. I will tell you the truth. I will not fight with you. Same the Quran says in Surah Kafirun, chapter hundred and nine, verse number one to six. Qul ya ayyul kafiruna, la abdu ma ta abduna, wala antum abduna ma abud, wala ana abdu ma abdum, wala antum abduna ma abud. Lakum dinu kum waliya din. Say to those who reject faith, I will not worship what you worship, nor will you worship what I worship. I will not be worshiping that which you want me to worship nor will you worship what I worship to you is your way to me is mine to your your religion to me is mine I will present the truth to him why don't do idol worship 
डोंट हैव रॉन्ग कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ गॉड ये डिफ यू हैव लकुम दीन हुकुम वल ये दीन टू यूज योर वे टू मीज माइन द होली कुरान सेज इन सूरह बकरा चैप्टर 2 वर्स नंबर 256 ला इकराह फिद दीन देयर इज नो कंपल्शन रिलीजन ट्रुथ स्टैंड्स आउट क्लियर फ्रॉम एरर इफ यू होल्ड द हैंड ऑफ अल्लाह सुभान व तआला ही विल टेक यू फ्रॉम डार्कनेस टू लाइट इफ यू होल्ड द हैंड ऑफ द इविल वन द डेविल ही विल टेक यू From light to darkness, the choice is yours. But no religion says that you should fight with each other unnecessarily. Hope that answers the question. My name is Sushil Karangutkar, official photographer, All India Radio, Vivid Bharati Service, and Bombay Doordarshan Kendra. I have visited holy country of uh, Islam, that is Saudi Arabia, three times, and spent nearly four years uh, in Saudi Arabia and watched Islam from closer distance. now dr jakinak my question is there is a muslim blind person he is one eye is replaced by eye donated by hindu person his kidney one kidney is replaced by kidney donated by christian person and his heart is replaced by heart donated by parsi gentleman such a muslim person will be allowed to perform prayers in the mosque the brother has a question that he had been to saudi arabia and one person is eyes from a hindu or heart from a christian and kidney from so and so various things so having eye from another religion heart from another religion can you offer salah in the mosque the answer is brother according to islam every human being is born as a muslim every heart is a muslim every kidney is a muslim every eye is a muslim what is the meaning of muslim muslim is a person who submits will to allah subhanahu wa taala every heart submits will to allah subhanahu wa taala i'm talking about the organic heart organic heart na no? organic heart it pumps blood the heart of the christian pumps blood the heart of a muslim pumps blood the heart of a hindu pumps blood the heart is a muslim I'm talking about the organic heart i the organic i is a muslim but you see wrong things i'm sorry i'm not telling you you miss you the human being sees wrong thing so human being is to blame but the eye sees the eye is following the will of allah subhanahu wa taala the kidney it's doing its job it's purifying it's a muslim so with the heart taken from a person who's born in a hindu family or christian family every heart is a muslim every eye is a muslim every kidney is a muslim he will be very well allowed to play in a mosque but even if a non muslim wants to come to the mosque he is most welcome Our beloved Prophet, he had discussions about concept of God. Time didn't permit me the revelation of Surah Ikhlas, the touchstone, the touchstone of theology, which I gave to everyone, was revealed when when he was having a discussion with the Christians in the mosque, and they asked him, "Who is Allah? What can you think? The Quran says you convert all the trees into pens, all the ocean into ink. What will he say, Rahman, Rahim? What answer can he give? The direct revelation came. Kul, tell them." قل هو الله احد سيد الله ورن اونلي الله الصمد الله ذي ابصر ذي ايترنال لم يلد ولم يولد هي بيجت نوت نويز بيغوتن ولم يقل له كفوان احد ذير ناثينغ لايك هيم نيكست كويشن فروم ذا سليب از فروم سواتي اس ملك شي از ان انجينير از يو منشند ان يور توك ذات هندو سي سن مون سنيك اند مانكي از جاد basically it's not like that we hindus don't believe that the above mentioned things are god but we believe that god is everywhere god is in each and everything god is in coat god is in air in fire does islam believe the same if not then why what's wrong in this the question posed was that they believe that the moon the sun the tree they and god but god is present everywhere since god is present everywhere therefore we worship it what does islam believe see the holy quran says that wherever you turn your face you will find allah subhanahu wa taala allah is everywhere but what does it mean are you talking allah is present physically first question is is allah physical when quran says allah is everywhere do you mean it is physical my question is what do you mean allah is everywhere is it physical if physical if you believe allah is physical then you should be able to see it 
No, I can say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not physical. The knowledge of Allah is everywhere. The knowledge of Allah is everywhere. Allah has power over all things. But physically, He's not everywhere. First of all, is God physical? So therefore, the Quran gives the logic. In Surah Shura, chapter 42, verse number 11. Laisa kamisli shay. There's nothing unto Him. Nothing like whatever unto Him. So if you give physical natures to God, that's the reason you worship the idols. So I'm telling you, the moment you worship the sun, do you mean to say God is only there, nowhere else? Or well, even if I agree with you, okay, you say God is everywhere, sake of argument, I agree with you. But then you're worshipping only small part of God. The tree, very small in the full universe, speck. That means, indirectly, you are saying well, God is so small, only in the tree, only in the snake. So therefore, if you have to worship, worship the true God Almighty. Even though His knowledge is present everywhere, He is present everywhere, not in the physical form. Hope that answers the question. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Brother Zakir Nayak. My question is regarding the form of Allah. Surah number 39, Zumar, verse 67. The translation says that, and on the day of resurrection, the whole of the earth will be grasped by his hand and the heavens will be rolled up in his right hand. There is also an hadith in support of this, Sahih al-Bukhari, volume 6, hadith number 336. Can we just imagine some form of Allah? The sister asked a question and Surah Al-Zumur, it says, she's correct, Quran does say that, that on the day of judgment is the resurrection, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold all the creation and various verses in the Quran, etc. But if you heard my talk, sister, I gave you the key word. The key, the key to this concept is Surah Ashura, chapter 42, verse number 11, which says, there is nothing whatever like him. So if Quran says Allah has hands, people ask me that the Quran says Allah holds the sky. What do you mean he holds like that? If I say I am holding my family together, do you mean to the 24 hours I am with my wife and my child? I'm not holding my wife and child always, yet I'm holding them, but I'm not holding them like that. These are words used. And whenever, as I said, if Quran says Allah sees and hears, you owe that my Allah is here like us. He hears. How he hears? Allah Alam. Allah knows. He has a hand, but not like yours and mine. Five fingers. With nail. And with this. Not like that. He has a hand? Yes, he has a hand. How he has a hand? There is nothing like him. How will he do it? Allah Alam. He will do it for sure. Quran says he rolled in the right hand. He will hold it in the right hand. How we'll hold it with five fingers or six fingers, I don't know. On the day of judgment, inshallah, you and I will witness that. The next question from the slip. Assalamu alaikum, brother Zakir. As Muslims, we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Noor. We cannot attribute any form or gender to Him. Why then, when we speak of Almighty God, or as written in the Holy Quran, Allah is always referred to as He, a sister. The sister asked a very good question, and this question had troubled me for several years. And she asked the question, Allah is Noor, He has got no form, no gender. So why is it written as Hua, as He? And this question asked to various people, you know, in India and other scholars, but never got a satisfactory reply. Then I myself did a little research and then I checked it up with the experts. That when I learned Arabic, the grammar, the Arabic grammar has got only two genders, male and female. English language, three gender, male, female, neuter. So if we translate hua into English, it can be translated as he or as it. Either he or it. Same as hia. If you translate into English, it can be translated as she or it. That's Arabic language, two genders. English language, three genders. So who, if you translate, you can translate he or it. He or as she or it. So, who, in English if you say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beyond any gender. So why have used he? Some people may say that if who means 
he and it and here means she and it both means it so why did allah use who and not here because quran says kul huwa allah hu ahad say he is allah one and only when i learned in grammar in arabic grammar i was told that in the arabic grammar there are certain rules and criteria for feminine gender feminine gender first if it is feminine in nature like mother ummun it becomes a feminine gender second rule if it ends with the the it is feminine gender like mirwahatun fan ending with the it becomes feminine gender allah subhanahu wa taala is not a female so it can't be feminine it is not ending with the is it ending with the no so can't be feminine third is it should end with bada alif then becomes feminine allah doesn't end with bada alif so it can't become feminine and another one is that pairs of the body twos like eyes ainun feminine yadun hands feminine allah is kul huwa allah wahd say the allah one and only it's not pair so therefore in defection in default since it can't be used as he are it that she it allah uses who are it otherwise allah subhanahu wa taala has got no gender at all assalamu alaikum brother brother my, my name is ali hussain now in your talk you have mentioned that and even in your earlier talks which i have heard you have mentioned that jesus in bible is nowhere claiming divinity now i had gone through a booklet which was propagating christianity and implying that all the sufferings are uh, healed by jesus peace be upon him and uh, it gave the reference that jesus is saying i am the lord who heals you and the reference was from exodus chapter number 15 verse number 26 and even it went further saying that in first john chapter number 1 verse number 7 the blood of jesus his, his son cleanses us from all sins now my emphasis on the first reference where he is saying that i am the lord who heals you now doesn't this imply or doesn't this indicate that jesus is claiming divinity the brother is quoting exodus chapter number 15 verse number 26 verse 26 and saying jesus said that i healed you brother exodus is a part of the old testament old testament jesus ka is never spoken exodus never i said in my talk there is not a single unequivocal statement in the whole bible where jesus peace be upon him himself says that is god worship me this is the bible i have got by the christians king james version everything what jesus ka spoke is in red you check it up this will never be in red it is not the words of jesus it is word of somebody else and even if i agree with you for sake of argument that jesus did say that he heals and the quran does agree with that and i said in my talk we believe that he gave life to the dead with god's permission he healed those born and blind with god's permission so i have got no objection agreeing that jesus christ peace be upon him did heal the people it's our faith even we believe in it but whatever he did as the bible says in the gospel of matthew chapter number 12 verse number 28 he cast out devil by the spirit of god gospel of luke chapter number 11 verse number 20 with the finger of god he cast out devils he did everything which bore witness of the father so i've got no objection in agreeing that jesus did do miracle but regarding exodus it's not the word of jesus christ peace be upon him even if it is i've got no objection because whatever miracles he did jesus christ peace be upon him said that this is done by allah subhanahu wa taala and again jesus christ peace be upon him said in the gospel of matthew chapter number 24 verse number 24 for there shall arise many false christ and false prophets and if it were possible they shall deceive the very elect miracle is not the test jesus christ peace be upon him said it's mentioned in the gospel of matthew chapter number 11 verse number 11 of those that are born of a woman the greatest person is john the baptist those that are born of a woman the greatest person is john the baptist that means he was greater even than jesus peace be upon him because jesus was born to mother mary so amongst all born of a woman the greatest is john the baptist according to jesus peace be upon him which miracle did he do not a single therefore miracle is not the criteria to make him god hope that answers the question i'm sorry the management of the hall has requested ke we would not be permitted to extend the program further due to limitations of time and a next program coming up 
So though we appreciate, I have just one or two announcements. If you have any further questions on the subject or on Islam and comparative religion, you are most welcome to attend our lectures followed by question and answer sessions every Saturday at 3 p.m., every Sunday at 10.30 a.m. and every Monday for ladies at 3 p.m. at the Islamic Research Foundation Auditorium. Our next major public talk on Salah, the programming towards righteousness by Dr. Zakir Naik will inshallah be held on Sunday 7th December 1997 at 10 a.m. at Patkar Hall, Marine Lines, Mumbai. Let me once again remind you that besides the daily morning relay of IRF program on cable TV for three hours in Mumbai, the ATN satellite TV channel telecasts IRF programs on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays from 6 a.m. to 6.30 a.m. Indian Standard Time across 68 countries of the world. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for making this program possible. On behalf of the Islamic Research Foundation, I thank all our guests, including the press for attending the program. We also appreciate and thank all the persons involved in the organizing and recording of this event, Jazakamullah Khairan. Down the ages past, Allah sent His messengers to deliver humankind from darkness to light. Invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preachings and argue with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. That's also the ongoing mission of Islamic Research Foundation or IRF, spreading the truth of Allah's final message to mankind. Founded in 1991, IRF today offers some of the best services and facilities in the world for presenting an understanding of Islam in an objective and scientific way. Its programs are primarily focused on correcting misconceptions and promoting understanding of Islam. IRF also imparts Dawa training to Dais to aptly convey the message of Islam. IRF has one of the most modern studios producing programs presenting Islam which are beamed regularly on many international TV channels in over 150 countries. Dr. Zakir Naik, President of IRF, reaching out across countries worldwide from America to Europe to Africa to Asia to Australia, strives to clarify Islamic viewpoints. He dispels the many media myths and anti-Islamic prejudices propagated the world over by anti-Islamic forces. Dr. Zakir Naik is a medical doctor. He is acclaimed the world over for his spontaneous and convincing replies to questions posed by critics and skeptics during the question and answer sessions after his talks. He is also renowned for his verbatim quotes with references from major religious scriptures of the world. Dr. Zakir and other faculty of the IRF train many Dais in effective Dawa techniques. IRF's website provides free Dawa training material for you to download and become an effective Dai yourself. Dr. Zakir Naik's talks are available on audio and video, cassettes, CDs and DVDs the world over. IRF today is creating a change in the hearts and minds of millions of Muslims and non-Muslims worldwide towards a proper understanding and respect for Islam. Have a question or doubt about Islam and its teachings? Now you know, one of the best resource centers to get convincing answers from is Islamic Research Foundation. 5658 Tandil Street, North Dongri, Mumbai, 400009, India. Phone 2373-6875. Fax 9122-2373-0689. Email islam at the rate of irf.net. For more information, log on to our website www.irf.net.